are, we are going. So, uh, just going to run these same as I have in the past. I'm just going to go one question at a time. And if it's one that you want to see, just say yes. Uh, if you don't want to see it, don't say anything. Somebody else might want to see it. If I don't hear any yeses, I'm going to move on to the next one. So, uh, all right. <coughs> Uh, so, uh, and yeah, just going through a set of practice problems. Just stay with the here. Uh, let's see, so uh, number one. Yes, okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, number one says number of SP2 hybrid orbitals on the carbon atom in CO3 2 minus is. Uh, now, this one has a little bit of, uh, I don't want to say this direction, but not quite the uh, right, uh, uh, right phrase, because it's not misdirecting you, it just has a little bit of extra stuff. It doesn't really matter that it's CO3 2 minus. If you're making sp2 hybrid orbitals, how many are you making? You're making three because you have an s orbital and two p orbitals. That's three atomic orbitals. If you mix together three atomic orbitals, you're going to get three hybrid orbitals. So if you're making sp2s, you're making three. That's, it doesn't matter what the species is. That's what you're going to be making. So that's why uh, that's why number one is uh, three. If you wanted to, you could have gone through and done the, uh, uh, the dot diagram and you would have ended up with something like this. And the double bond could have been, you know, somewhere else. So your dot diagram would have looked like that. And uh, you can see we have three electron groups on there. So we need three hybrid orbitals, and we get those using three atomic orbitals, sp2. Okay, so lots of different ways to get the answer there, three. Are we good, Devin? Questions? Okay, uh, let's see, number two. Yeah, um, okay, so that's just, uh, just, that's just a matter of looking on the table. Um, so we see for something that's uh, tetrahedral electron group arrangement, we have to have four electron groups. And so if we have four electron groups, that means we need four hybrid orbitals, and we make those with three, or I'm sorry, with four uh, atomic orbitals. And so four atomic orbitals is gonna be an S, and then you've got three Ps to add in there, and so that's going to be uh, SP3. Tetrahedral clattering is always sp3. It's got four electron groups. Uh, number three. Yeah. Okay. Three is just a little bit of memorization. Uh, so a single bond is always a sigma bond. A double bond is always going to be a sigma and a pi. Those are your two. And then a triple bond is always going to be a sigma and two pi. It just keeps adding up, and that's as far as we go. So a single, double, triple. So it's a sigma for a single, sigma and a pi for a double, a sigma and two pi's for a triple. Okay, so that's just how they, that's how they end up going, because you get the two overlapping atomic orbitals for a triple on there. Questions on that one? Uh, number four. Yes. Yeah. Should I just stop asking? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I had a feeling it was going to go like that. I talked to uh, Dr. Grumshire this morning. He goes, yeah, we did all of them. I said, yeah, that's not unexpected. <laughs> it's, that's just this chapter of this unit. I, I told you guys day one of the unit. This is probably going to be the hardest unit we do this semester. So. Um, all right, so uh, the carbon oxygen double bond in COCl2 can be described as uh, what? Okay, uh, this is always kind of hard to draw. I'll, I'll just be honest, I'm not a very good artist, and for those of you who have me in class, you know that. Um, so if we do a dot structure uh, for, I'm just, well, I'm not going to do a dot structure, I just want to show. Uh, the hybrid orbitals here. So here are your, uh, your sp2 hybrids. So uh, if you look at the dot structure for COCl2, you've got a double bond between the carbon and the oxygen. You've got single bonds between the carbon and the two chlorines. So you've got three bonding groups there. So you've got sp2 uh, hybridization there. 
And so the oxygen that's sitting out here, uh, that doesn't need to hybridize. Only that central atom ever hybridizes. And so this oxygen has uh, p orbitals that can bond. So there's a p orbital there. And so that creates a sigma bond. Okay, and that's between the sp2 hybrid, I'm not going to write that very well, and the p orbital of the oxygen. And then the pi bond here comes because the oxygen has another p orbital that has a single electron in it. The carbon, because it uh, hybridized only two of the p orbitals, it still has one left that's unhybridized and it's sticking up. And it's going to be parallel to one of those p orbitals on the oxygen, and that can form a pi bond. And so that's going to form between a p orbital on the carbon and a p orbital on the oxygen. Why is the oxygen only a p instead of like a p two? So the only the only atom that hybridizes is the one in the center. So the reason we hybridize orbitals is you know, we, again, this is just a mathematical reason that we, that it's a way we can say this is how uh, the geometries occur in these molecules. And so all of the, all of the geometry in a molecule is determined by that central atom. So that's the only one that needs to hybridize to get the bonds in the, in the proper place, out at the proper angle. The outer atoms, can, they can bond it anywhere they want. So the, the oxygen just needs a p orbital to come in but that carbon, whatever your central atom is, has to hybridize to get its orbitals pointed in the right direction. Does that make sense? Um, well, I, I, are you asking why is the oxygen not hybridized? Okay, so the only atom that hybridizes is the central atom. The oxygen isn't the central atom, the carbon atom. Because there's two other chlorines out here. And so they would have had p orbitals on them as well. Okay, so the only the only atom in a molecule that hybridizes are, are central atoms, and they do that. You know, we, we use that that description so that we can explain how those ang the bond angles um, come about. That's a double bond between carbon and oxygen. Yes. Yeah, so we've got a sigma bond that exists between the S, one of the hybrid sp2s and one of the p orbitals on oxygen. And so they're, they're overlapping this way. And then you've got the unhybridized p orbital on carbon and the p orbital on oxygen overlapping side by side as a pile. So then, what, sorry, what was the answer? Uh, I think it's B. Uh, B, yes, yeah, so a sigma bond involving an sp2 on carbon. Uh, and a pi bond involving a p bond, a p orbital carbon. Yeah. I know this. This is this is weird stuff. It's hard to visualize. Let's see. That was oh, that was number. That was number four, not number three. So number five, everybody, five? Yep. Okay, so what is the hybridization on the nitrogen atom in NO2 minus and NO3 minus? So we need to do dot structures for those. For NO2 minus, I'm just going to finish the dot structure here. You should be able to go through and do that one on your own. So I'll show you the final result. Okay, so there's NO2 minus, and then for NO3 minus, still on the page, okay, so that's NO3 minus. Okay, so in both of these, we have uh, three electron groups. Because we've got an NO2 minus, we've got two bonding groups in the lone pair. And for NO3, we also have three electron groups. So if we have three electron groups, 
we have to have three hybrid orbitals, and so three hybrid orbitals are going to result from an S and two P's, and so that's also going to be SP2. So they both have SP2 hybridization. So if you, if you need three electron groups, you've got to have three hybrid orbitals. Three hybrid orbitals are made from three atomic orbitals, and those orbitals get taken in order. So first comes the S, and then as many P's as you need. If you need more than P's, then you start moving into the D's. Okay, questions at all on that one? Yep, yeah, sorry. One electron group doesn't matter if it's a single bond, a double bond, or a triple bond. It's just one group. All right. Where are we at? Uh, number six. Okay, so number six says give the hybridization for O and OF2. I don't know why I didn't have that one drawn out here. Uh, but that's going to have. Six and fourteen, so that's going to be twenty electrons. O goes in the middle. F's go there. So that used up twelve electrons. I got four left, so they've got to go here. And so now, if we look at our oxygen, there we see it has four electron groups around it. So if we have four electron groups, I need four hybrid orbitals. So that means I need four atomic orbitals to make those. And that's going to be an S and three P's. So SP3 would be my hybridization. Questions on that at all? Okay, number seven. So it says if an electron is added to H2, it would go into what? Okay, so for that we need to draw out the, uh, the MO diagrams for H2. So if we look at our two hydrogen atoms here, they both have an electron in them. They're going to come together in a sigma 1s, because those are 1s orbitals. And that's a sigma 1s star, it's our anti-bonding. Okay, so with just H2, they're going to come together like that and give us just two electrons and one bonding orbital. That's why we draw H2 with a single bond. But it says if we add an electron uh, to H2, where is it going to go? Well, it can't go into the sigma 1s because that's already filled, and so it has to go in up here into the sigma 1s star. And because it's going into an anti-bonding orbital, it's going to weaken the bonding. Okay, anytime you start putting electrons into anti-bonding orbitals, they weaken the bonds. Questions at all? Okay, uh, let's see. Okay, so number eight. Uh, number eight says, uh, the MO diagram below is appropriate for B2 based on this diagram, B2 what? Okay, so let's take a look at number eight. I'm just gonna write it down there, but I'm gonna draw it way off to the side here. Okay, so we've got our, I'm just going to draw the molecular orbitals here. So we've got a, this starts in the 1s, so sigma 1s, sigma 1s star, and then we've got a sigma 2s, and sigma 2s, can't write that, sigma 2s star, and then we've got our pi 2p, and 
And we've got our sigma 2p. I'm going to run out of space here. And we've got our pi 2p star. And then our sigma 2p star. All right. So for b2, okay, so since this starts all the way down into 1s, that means it's using all of the electrons, not just valence electrons. So uh, boron usually has five electrons, it's element five. Uh, so I have two of them, so I have a total of 10 electrons to go into the molecular orbitals for, uh, for B2. So all we need to do is just fill this up from the bottom to the top with electrons. So two are gonna go there, two are gonna go there, that's four, two more are gonna go there, that's six, two more are gonna go there, that's eight. I'm gonna have one go there, and one go there, that's 10. Okay, so the question is, uh, is it paramagnetic or is it diamagnetic? And what is its bond order? So if we look at the bond order, uh, we've got a, uh, you can go ahead and calculate that out. We've got two, four, five, six electrons in bonding orbitals. We've got two, four, not minus two, we've got four in uh, anti-bonding orbitals, divided by two, that gives me two over two, so that gives me a bond order of one. We see that we have electrons that are unpaired, so that means it is diamagnetic. I'm sorry, paramagnetic. Paramagnetic. Questions there at all? Questions? And if, uh, just in case you haven't looked at the, uh, at the sheet uh, that we give you um, for the exam, it'll be that right there. So you will have those two diagrams uh, on the exam. Um, so, well, they both only apply to certain elements, but the elements are right down here. Uh, boron, carbon, nitrogen, and then this says oxygen, fluorine, neon. So it tells you exactly which one they belong to. So this is uh, boron 2. Boron, two. boron has 5 electrons, 2 of S10. Yeah. Total electrons, because it started at the 1S. Yeah. All right. Swap my page. Uh, let's see, number 9. Well. Number nine is kind of a silly question after number eight, isn't it? Because <laughs> it's B2. Uh, so anyways, but the one thing to notice about number nine is that uh, those orbital diagrams, and this is the one that's on your, uh, on your sheet, is that starts with the 2S. So it just uses the 2S and the 2P orbitals. So for those diagrams, you're going to use the valence electrons only. You don't need to use the core 1S electrons from the, uh, uh, from the 1S. Now the other thing you can do, you'll notice what I did on that, on that problem, is I just counted up the total number of electrons that I have in that, uh, in that molecule, and then I just filled up that center column in the molecular orbital diagram, and, and you can do that too. You don't have to fill electrons in the 2s and the 2ps if you don't want to. Those are just for the atoms. They, you know, for some people, they help you keep track of the total number of electrons. But if you can figure out the total number of electrons down here, you know, just write down a count and then just fill them up as you go uh, to figure out, you know, diamagnetic or paramagnetic to figure out your bond order. Um, you don't have to fill in these outer wings here if you don't want to, because they're not part of the molecule. They're just kind of your starting material. Does that make sense? You just need to worry about the total number of electrons in that molecule and filling up the, that center column, because those are the molecular orbitals. That's where the electrons are in there. All right. Uh, number 10. So it says, given that O2 is paramagnetic and has a bond order of 2, 
and its highest occupied molecular orbital is anti-bonding, what would be the expected bond orders for O2 2 minus and O2 2 plus? Okay, so um, we don't actually have to draw this one out because it's given, a, given us enough uh, information here. Um, so uh, we know that O2 has electrons in the, in, in the anti-bonding. So if I add any more electrons, where do they have to go? Into the anti-bonding, because obviously everything down below is filled up. Okay. So um, if I go O2 2 minus, that means I've added two electrons. So if I've added two electrons, what have I done to the bond order? Because I've had to put them into an anti-bond. So that's going to decrease your bond order by one. I'm seeing a lot of blank stairs out there, so let's just do it. We'll just do it the brute force way, and we'll, we'll draw it on out. I might let it report here for number 10. There we go. All right, so, for oxygen, we've got our sigma 2s. Actually, I just need to move my lens there. Thank you. My sigma 2s star. For oxygen, we're going to have the sigma 2p, pi 2p. Pi 2p star and sigma 2p star. Okay, so for oxygen, for valence electrons, we've got 12. So, 2, 4, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Okay, so there's our molecular orbital diagram for, uh, for oxygen, just O2. All right, so if I add two electrons... They're going to go in here, aren't they? I'm going to I'd put one right there and one right there. And if we calculate a bond order here, if we do O2, we would have 2, 4, 6, 8 in bonding, minus 1, 2, 3, 4 in anti-bonding, divided by 2, that's going to give me a bond order of 2, which would be our double bond that we always see for oxygen. Okay, for O2, whoops, O2, 2 minus, we've got these extra two electrons here, and so that's going to give me still eight electrons in a bonding, six electrons in anti-bonding, divided by two, and so now that gives me a bond order of one, or if we do O2, 2 plus, that would wipe out those electrons and two plus, and now I've got still eight electrons in bonding, but now I've only got two in anti-bonding divided by two, and that would give me a bond order of three. So I would have bond orders of one for oxygen two minus, and a bond order of three for oxygen two plus. Well, it depends on, again, what it gives you. If it's starting at the 2s, valence only. If it's starting at the 1s, all the electrons. So this, the, the sheet that we give you um, on the back, this one here, so this one starts at the 2s, so you can use uh, valence only. Right, any questions on that one? All right. How about number 11? Did we go to number 11? You want to see number 11? No. Okay. Yeah? Okay. It says, which of the following represents a physical property? Uh, so this is something that you can measure or observe without changing the physical characteristics of, um, of the material. Uh, so the correct answer there is A, mercury is a silvery liquid or room temperature. We can make that observation uh, without 
changing the mercury at all. We don't have to do anything to the mercury chemically to change it to, to make that observation. So that's why it's a physical property. We look at B, extremely reactive with chlorine gas. That's a chemical property because I would have to react with chlorine gas to see um, if that happens or not. Butane is highly flammable. Again, I would have to I would have to light it on fire to see if it's highly flammable to verify that. And that would change into uh, other substances. Uh, argon has an unreactive nature. Uh, again, I would have to try to uh, react with other things. Even though it did react and I didn't change it, I would, I'm still trying to. So the fact that it doesn't react is a chemical property. And then aluminum has a tendency to rust. Again, uh, that's a reaction with oxygen, and that is also going to be a chemical property. Okay, so A is, uh, a is the only physical property. All right. Uh, number 12. Yes. yes. So stoichiometric coefficient for oxygen when the following is balanced. Okay, so we've got C3, HAO, plus O2, goes to CO2, plus H2O. Okay, so we're just going to go left to right. I've got three carbons there, I've got one there, so I'm going to put a three there. I've got eight hydrogens, two hydrogens, so I need a four there. Now for oxygens, I've got one here and two here. Over here I've got uh, three times two is six. And over here I've got ten. I don't really want to change this out here to try to do any balancing, do I? Because if I change that, that's going to mess with the carbons, mess with the hydrogens. Okay, so I really want to try to do that one. So I need ten oxygens over here. This first compound accounts for one of those, so I have to get nine oxygens out of O2. Well, uh, if you have me for class, you know that's like trying to get nine shoes out of pairs. Okay, how many pairs of shoes do you need to buy to get nine shoes? Well, you've got to buy nine halves of, of a pair of shoes, or four and a half. So, that would give me nine oxygens here, and oxygen there, so ten. We don't like writing our coefficients with halves, and so we just multiply everything by two to clear that out. So this becomes a two, this becomes a nine, that becomes a six, and that becomes an eight. And so the question asks, what's the coefficient for the oxygen? And it's nine. Did you good with that one? Number 13. It's good 13, okay. Uh, 14. 14, I don't, I don't like the question, 14. Uh, just because it says on a microscopic level, what does that mean? Uh, and that's really not a very good term for dealing with molecules because they're much smaller than what a microscope can see. Well, it's like an electron microscope, but even that's pushing it. Uh, so yeah, the correct answer there is A, we're looking at the, I like to call it nanoscopic, uh, a molecule of nitrogen reacts with three molecules of hydrogen to give two molecules um, of ammonia. If I had put that on an exam, uh, one, I'd probably be slapping myself for doing it, but I would have counted A and I would have also counted B correct as well, because as far as I'm concerned, that means the same thing. It's probably more important to understand that, that we use the moles for it, um, as well as the molecules. So I would have counted either A or B correct on an exam. But I would try really hard enough for questions like that on exams. All right. Uh, number 15. Yeah, okay. Thought I was going to get away with that one. Ah, so close. All right, so... Uh, so this one says, how many moles of CuO can be produced from 1.45 moles of Cu2O in the following reaction? So um, remember that we, we had kind of a flow chart for stoichiometry problems. We want grams 
to moles, moles to moles, and moles to grams. Kind of a general flow chart. But not every problem goes all the way from grams to grams. And so it's important to know where are you entering this flow chart and where are you going to exit this flow chart. So in this problem, we are already given uh, moles of uh, Cu2O. So we're going to go in at moles. And we're looking for moles of CuO, so we're going to exit at moles. Um, so we don't even have to take anywhere near the whole trick here. Uh, we're given moles, looking for moles. We only need to do this one conversion right here between moles of one thing and moles of another. And so to do that, we use our stoichiometry. So uh, if we look at our reaction, it's, we always want to write down what we're given. We have uh, 0 0.450 moles of Cu2O. And for our conversion factor, uh, we see that we have uh, 4 moles of CuO for every 2 moles of Cu2O. Okay, so those numbers came directly from the balanced reaction. That allows my moles of Cu2O to cancel, and I get 0 0.9 zero zero moles of CuO for my answer. Okay, any questions on that? Any questions? Uh, number 16. So 16 says how many moles of BCl3 are needed to produce 25 grams of HCl in the following reaction. And so this is a uh, uh, problem where we're entering in grams and we're going to exit at moles. I don't, know if, I don't know if you've seen one like that, but it's not any different. And so we know that we want 25 grams of HCl. So that's where, that's where we're going to start. Start with our grams. And we want to convert our grams of HCl into moles of HCl. So we have uh, one mole for every 36.45 grams. And when we work that one out, we get 0 0.6859 moles of HCl. Okay, so now I know how many moles of HCl I have, so now I'm going to take that answer and I'm just going to bring it right down here to start the next part. So 0 0.6859 moles of HCl, and I'm going to convert it into moles of BCl3. And according to my reaction there, I need, I get one, I need one mole of BCl3 for every three moles of HCl. So I divide that by three, and I get 0 0.229 moles of BCl3. Everybody okay with that one? Seventeen more stoichiometry. Woo. So this one we have to balance the equation. So the balance the chemical equation given below, and then determine the moles of iodine that reacts with ten grams of aluminum. So uh, just a little bit uh, different from the previous problem. Uh, we've got to make sure that we balance that reaction first. So we've got aluminum solid <coughs> plus I two. Going to Al2I6. Got to have two aluminums there, three iodines there, and I'm balanced. That's nice. That was a nice balancing uh, equation there. So um, again, we're, we're given grams and we want moles of another substance. So we're going to go grams to moles of our the substance we're given, and then we're going to convert moles to moles 
for the new substance, and that's where, the, that's where it ends. So we don't even have to go all the way to grams again. So let's do that. So we're going to we're given grams of aluminum. So we get 10 grams of aluminum. We're going to change that into moles of aluminum. And it's one mole per 26.98 grams. And that comes out to be 0 0.3706 moles of al. It's a whole lot of al. So we're going to take that number and move it down to here. Start our next calculation with it. And so we want to convert that into moles of I2. And according to our reaction, we, get, we need 3 moles of I2 for every 2 moles of aluminum. So our moles cancel there. It leaves us with moles of I2. And we get 0 0.556 moles of I2. And if we had to, we would just take the molar mass and change that to grams, but it didn't ask for that, so we don't need to do that. So that gives us a question, that gives us answer A. Questions at all on that? Okay, so all these stoichiometry, kind of the grams to moles, moles to moles, moles to grams, you just need to keep track of where is it asking me to enter, where is it asking me to exit. Okay, it's kind of like getting on and off the highway. So that's going to be uh, N2O. It decomposes, and so that's going to be, that's my only reactant, it decomposes. That's my react uh, to form nitrogen gas. You can't forget that nitrogen gas is diatomic, so it forms N2. And oxygen gas, also diatomic, so that forms N2. One of the most common errors on this one is to just write N and O for those gases. And if you do that, it won't balance. So now we've got to go through, we've got to make sure that this is balanced. I've got two nitrogens here and two nitrogens here. That's balanced. I got one oxygen here. Oh, I got two oxygens over here. So I've got to put a two out here to balance the oxygens. But that threw the, ni threw the nitrogens out of balance. But eh, we can just put that in there and now we are balanced. We've got four nitrogens on both sides and two oxygens. So we are set. All right, now we can do our stoichiometry. We have uh, five grams of N2O that we were given. We want to convert that into mole, so it's going to be one mole per 44 grams. So that comes out to be 0 0.1136 moles of N2O. So now I'm going to take that value. I'm going to put it right down here. So I've got 0 0.1136 moles of N2O times. And now I want to convert moles of N2O into moles of what I'm looking for. I'm looking for oxygen. So let's go to moles of oxygen. And there's one mole of O2 for every two moles of N2O. So my moles of N2O cancel. That leaves me with 0 0.0568 moles of O2. And now I just take that value and come down here, and we're going to convert that into grams. So I got 0 
moles about 2 times uh, 32 grams per 1 mole for O2 and that comes out to be 1.82 grams of O2 which would be answer uh, C. You can always, yeah, you can always do it with just one big long one. Um, some people use the, the ladder method or the stair step method. Some people just write conversion factor after conversion factor. As long as you get all the conversion factors right, it's going to come out just fine. Uh, I just like to teach it this way because you can see each calculation separately. All right. Number, where are we at? 19. Alright, so 19, it says when 10 grams of calcium metal is reacted with water, 5 grams of calcium hydroxide is produced. Using the following balanced equation, calculate the percent yield for the reaction. So this one takes a little bit of uh, what figuring out what exactly have they told me. So uh, we were given an amount of calcium metal, and then we're given 5 grams of calcium hydroxide is produced. That is an actual yield. They told me this is how much we got out. That's the actual yield. So what we've got to do is we've got to take that 10 grams of calcium metal, figure out what the theoretical yield is, and then take the actual yield we were given, divide that by the theoretical yield that we found, and then find what percent that is. So let's, uh, let's do that. Let's see. This is number, number 19. Okay. Okay, so we've got 10 grams of calcium. Okay, we want to convert that into moles. So we're going to go grams to moles, moles to moles, moles to grams here. So we convert that into moles of calcium, we get 0 0.2495 moles of calcium. Okay, I'm going to take that answer, just move it down here. Get 0 0.2495 moles of calcium times, and we look at our balanced reaction there, and we have one mole of calcium hydroxide for every one mole of calcium, so that's nice. So I get the same number of moles, 0 0.2495 moles calcium hydroxide okay, and I can take that and turn it into grams of calcium hydroxide so 0 0.2495 moles times and that weighs 74.08 grams for every one mole so my moles cancel, and that gives me 18.48 grams of calcium hydroxide. Okay, so this is my theoretical yield. Okay, that's how much I should have got out from 10 grams of calcium, but that's not what I got out. What I got out, according to the problem, was 5 grams. So my percent yield is going to be equal to my 5 grams, my actual, over my theoretical, 18.48 grams, times 100%. And what do you get? You get 27.1%. Questions at all on that one? That one had a lot of parts and pieces. All right, so number 20. Okay, so number 20, we've got, we're given uh, two reactant amounts. Okay, and if we're given two reactant amounts, what's the first thing that should go through your head? Limiting reactant problem. If you're given two reactant amounts, 
it's a limiting reactive problem 99% of the time. Okay, one of those is going to be uh, present in excess, and the other one's going to run out first, and that's going to be your limiting reactant. So that's the first thing we've got to try to do, is to figure out which one of these is our limiting reactant. Now, in order to do that, the first thing we've got to do is figure out how many moles of each one of those we have. So let's do the BCL3 first. Why the BCL3? I don't know. I felt like going in alphabetical order today. Didn't really matter. So 60.0 grams, BCL3. We're going to convert that into moles using the molar mass of BCL3. 117.16 grams. Our grams cancel. That gives us 0 0.512 moles. For the water, we have 37.5 grams. And we convert that into moles using its molar mass, 18 grams. So that's equal to 2.08 moles. Now, we can't just look at the number of moles and say that the BCL3 is limiting just because it's less. And the reason we can't do that is because according to uh, the reaction there, that water gets used up three times faster. Where did I go? There we go. Gets used up three times faster than the BCL3. So you've got to be careful about that. Okay, it's kind of like saying, let's say we were at a car factory, and let's say that we had 20 tires and six steering wheels. What's going to run out first? No? <laughs> it seems, oh, well, we've got a lot fewer steering wheels. Those are going to run out. But you've got to think about, well, how many do I need for each car? With 20 tires, how many cars can I make? I can make five. If I got six steering wheels, how many cars can I make? Six. I'm going to run out of steering wheels, or I'm going to run out of tires before I run out of steering wheels. So that's kind of what we're trying to figure out here. That's why we divide by that balancing coefficient. So the BCL3 gets divided by one because that's its coefficient. So what that really kind of means is that I can do the reaction with that many moles 0 0.512 times. Got to divide the water by 3, and that gives me 0 0.694. So I can do the reaction 0.694 times with that much water. So I compare these two numbers. Since 0.512 is less than 0.694, this is still my limiting reactant. Okay. Now that's all that we use that number is to see which is the limiting reactant. Okay, so now I know that I'm going to be using BCL3 to calculate everything else in the problem. I take my moles of BCL3 and do the rest of the problem. So now I'm going to go moles to moles. So 0 0.512 moles of BCL3 times 3 moles HCl for every one mole, BCl3, and I get 1.536 moles of HCl, and now I take that value and turn it into grams. should get 56.0 grams HCr. I think Dr. Grumstrup got like 55.7, which I thought was odd. Um, and when I did last year, I got 56. May have just been a digit issue there. Questions at all on that one? Let me take that. Uh, you mean the, the last bit of reactions? Yes. So the limiting reactions determines everything. At this point, it doesn't matter how much H2O I have. I could have two liters of water. It wouldn't affect that reaction. Yeah. All right. And page here. Uh, 
let's see, number 21. Let's see, for those of you in my class, do you recognize number 21? That was one of our clicker questions. Um, so, answer, or answer for 21 is B. It's, it's going to be very similar. I'm not going to go through and, uh, and work it out. It's going to be very similar to what we just did in number 20. So, we've got 2 grams of sulfur, 3 grams of oxygen, 4 grams of sodium. Okay. We're going to convert to the number of moles of each of those. So, we're going to go grams to moles. Once we figure out the moles of, of sulfur, moles of oxygen, moles of sodium hydroxide, uh, yeah, not sodium, sodium hydroxide. Uh, we then divide those number of moles by the balancing coefficients. So two for sulfur, three for oxygen, four for sodium hydroxide. Whichever of those numbers comes up least, that's your limiting reactant, and it turns out to be sodium hydroxide. We have the greatest number of moles, sodium hydroxide, but it also gets used up faster than the other reactants, and it turns out it's the limiting reactant. Okay, so you always have to take into account that uh, uh, that rate of being used up. All right. Uh, let's see. 22. Yes? This is definition. So molarity is moles of solute per liter of solution. It's very important to remember it's liter of solution. So that includes the solvent and the solute, all the space that the solute takes up. It's not always a lot, but it is for something fairly concentrated. Okay, so it's got to be the whole solution. All right, let's see, number 23. So you want to know how many grams of uh, silver nitrate are needed to make 250 milliliters of a solution that is 0.135 mole. Okay, so we look at this one, it's like, well, I need grams of silver nitrate. Uh, generally, before I can figure out how many grams I'm going to need, I need to figure out how many moles I'm going to need. And it doesn't tell me how many moles, but it does give me a volume and a concentration. And from volume and concentration, I can find my number of moles. So we're going to work it that way. So, we know we've got 0 0.250 liters. Okay, that's what 250 milliliters is. And I've, my solution concentration is 0 0.135 moles per one liter. Remember, that's what molarity means, is moles per one liter. So my liters are going to cancel there. That's going to give me 0 0.03 three, seven, five moles of AgNO3 that I need. And now I can take that many moles and convert that into grams. And just use the molar mass for that, and that's 169.88 grams per one mole. My moles will cancel out, and I get five point 7.3 grams. Any questions on that? Okay. Uh, 24. Uh, very similar type um, problem there. They were given uh, grams of sodium hydroxide. I don't think I worked that one out. Uh, grams of sodium hydroxide. So we're just going to go backwards on that one. We're going to go from grams of sodium hydroxide to moles of sodium hydroxide using molar mass of sodium hydroxide. And once we know the moles and the molarity, we can find the volume. Okay, so let's do that one real quick. So we know we're looking for 15.5 grams sodium hydroxide times one mole per 40 grams, if I remember my math right there.
that gives me 0 0.3875 moles. So now I've got 0 0.3875 moles. And I'm looking for uh, a volume here, and I've got 0 0.540 moles per liter, or one liter for every 0 0.540 moles. Remember, molarity is a conversion factor. It can be flipped up and down. So, when we divide that by 0.54, we get 0 0.718 liters. And so that becomes 718 milliliters of the data liter. So, 0 0.718. So again, just a series of conversion factors. There's really no chemistry here. It's just unit analysis is all it is. Okay. You guys can do unit analysis. I know you can. All right. Uh, number 25, I'm going to skip. Because uh, we're not, not going to ask any questions like that. Um, the trick on number 25 is you have to take into account the fact that there's three chlorines for every aluminum chloride, so you figure out the molarity of the aluminum chloride, and the chloride is going to be three times that. It's, yeah, we're not going to really look at that. We didn't look at that in class, so don't worry about 25. Let's see, number 26. So 26 is a dilution problem. It says how many milliliters of a 9 molar sulfuric acid solution are needed to make 0.25 liters of a 3.5 molar uh, H2SO4 solution. So we're just we're diluting a 9 molar solution down to a 3.5 molar solution. So when we're doing that, we can use M1 V1 is equal to M2 V2. Okay, you use that when you're doing dilution problems. You want to make sure you recognize the dilution problem. Okay, so uh, my M1 is 9.0, so I have 9.0 molar. I don't know my initial volume. My final molarity, I want to have 3.5 molar, and I want to have 0 0.25 liters of that. Okay, when I work that one out, I get volume for V1 of 0 0.0972 liters, and when I convert that into milliliters, I get 97.2 milliliters. So that comes out to be, which one? Uh, D, 97 milliliters. Questions on that one at all? Hands getting sore. As far as uh, number of problems on the exam, there's only 26 problems on the exam instead of the regular 31. Uh, it kind of cuts both ways. It means you don't have quite as many problems to work, so you can spend a little bit more time on each problem. Uh, but it also means that each problem's worth a few more, you know, not a few more points, just you know, a little, a little bit more points, but. Um, it's they're worth four points rather than three point three points. So, a little higher stakes for each problem. All right. Uh, let's see. Number twenty seven. There. We want to know what is the molar concentration of a solution that is prepared by dissolving four point seven nine grams of benzoic acid in a hundred milliliters of solution. And so we're given the chemical formula of benzoic acid, and so from that you have to find the molar mass so that you can figure out how many moles you've got. So when we do that, we've got 4.79 grams, I'm just going to call it BA for benzoic acid, times one mole per, and when you calculate all those benzoic acid atoms in there, you get 122 grams. Okay, so that comes out to be... Uh, 0 0.03926 moles of benzoic acid. 
And then we want the concentration in our molarity is always going to be equal to moles over volume in liters. And so we're going to do 0 0.03926 moles over. And we're looking for 100 milliliters of solution. That is 0 0.100 liters. And so when we worked it out, we get 0 0.39 uh, three really for the uh, molarity there. They got three nine two. I'm not sure how they did that. But well, there's not a whole lot of places they can round though. That's what's so weird because um, you get two six there. It may have been a slight difference there. If uh, there may have been some decimals out here that I that I missed. That would make sense. Questions on that one at all? Alright, uh, 27, uh, 28. So 28 says, what is the complete uh, ionic equation for the reaction of aqueous ammonium sulfate with aqueous barium chloride to form solid barium sulfate and aqueous ammonium chloride? Okay, so. Uh, we're given a lot of information, again, in words, and we have to go from words to chemical formulas. So, uh, so aqueous ammonium sulfate. So we look up, we see ammonium, uh, NH4, has a single plus on it as a polyatomic ion. It's combined with sulfate, SO4, 2 minus, and so that means I've got to have two ammoniums for my one sulfate, okay, NH4, two, SO4. I've got to have two pluses to match the two minuses of that sulfate. And then plus uh, aqueous barium chloride. Barium is a two plus ion that's in group two. Chlorine is a one minus ion for group seven, so I've got to have two of them there. I know, also know that that's aqueous because I'm told that. up a little bit. Uh, so we're going to form barium sulfate. So barium is a 2 plus. Sulfate is a 2 minus. So they can go right together like that. That is a solid plus and then uh, ammonium chloride. Okay, so ammonium chloride is a 1 plus. Chloride is a 1 minus. Or, yeah, ammonium is a 1 plus. Chloride is a 1 minus. So those come right together and that is also a Okay, so if we write this out, uh, one, we want to balance it first, uh, and then we'll do a complete ionic. So I've got two ammonium ions here. I've only got one here. So let's put the two there. That gave me two chlorines, which I needed over here anyways, and that's actually balanced, so that's really nice. Okay, so now we want to take our aqueous things and break them all apart. So that's going to give me two nh plus, those are aqueous, plus SO4, 2 minus, that is also aqueous, plus barium, 2 plus, aqueous, plus two chlorides, also aqueous, going to, now the barium sulfate here is a solid, so when we're writing our complete ionic, we don't break up our solid, no separate things that are aqueous. So that barium sulfate remains intact. And then plus two NH4 pluses aqueous and plus two Cl minuses also aqueous. So the question here was looking for the complete ionic equation. And so that's what we've got right here is the complete ionic. Not the net ionic. It didn't want the net ionic. A lot of people mistakenly just keep going here and start canceling things out. That's not what it was looking for. Okay, so the correct answer there is D, or uh, all those different aqueous things. Uh, there's a lot of little numbers and stuff to keep track of in there. You've got to make sure you do that in these kinds of problems. Ooh, pushing some time here. Let's see, that was 28.
Let's see, 29. 29 is a nasty problem. Don't worry about 29. Because uh, that had a little twist in there that most, most of you probably didn't know. Mercury is a really weird substance. Um, other than the fact that it's a metal that's liquid at room temperature. Uh, when it forms ions, Hg to mercury 1 is actually a diatomic cation. It's one of, the, I think it's the only one I know of. It's Hg2, 2 plus. And that's how mercury 1 forms. Would not expect you guys to know that, so ignore uh, 29. All right. Uh, let's see, how about number 30? This is some fairly new stuff. But number 30. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, <coughs> so there's a molecular equation. Um, so molecular equation is kind of what I wrote first, where all the formulas are written together. And we're just told that the radius that we write everything as a molecule, kind of like a molecule. A complete ionic is where we have all of the different ions uh, in, a, in a reaction, whether or not they show up in both reactants and products or not. Okay. And then a net ionic is where we would take the common ions and cancel them out. So uh, we have like two NH4s in reactants and we have two NH4s in products. We would cancel those out uh, to get the net ion, and we would do the same thing for the two chloros. So you have a molecular, complete ionic, and net ion. Any other questions? I'm sorry, it's sometimes it's hard to see hands with this many people. Alright. So, uh, uh, so number 30, very okay with number 30? You want to see number 30? No, you're okay? Alright. 31? Yep. Okay, so which combination will uh, produce a precipitate? Uh, so we need to go to our little tables there. Let's just look at 31 here. And so, uh, let's see here. Let's look, at the, let's look at the one that actually produces a precipitate. So what you've got to do is just combine things to see if they're going to give you something that's a precipitate. Okay, so for those of you in my class, we learned something called the belly button rule. Because you've got two kinds of belly buttons. You've got innies and outies. And so that's what we combine. You can write down your two substances, you combine the outies, and you combine the innies, and see if they give you a, a combination that will give you a precipitate. Okay, so for this one, sodium and nitrate. Well, we know that all sodium ions form soluble salts, or sodium ions only form soluble salts. There are no exceptions. So sodium will not form a precipitate with anything. So... Uh, or the nitrate is the same way. So if you looked at either of those, you're going to come to the conclusion sodium and nitrate will not form precipitate. What about iron and hydroxides? We see that most hydroxides are insoluble. Now there are some exceptions, okay, but the exceptions for, for hydroxide are calcium, strontium, or barium, or any of these other ones up here. Iron is not one of these exceptions. So iron and hydroxide will form a precipitate. That's how you use those tables. That's how you look at, at those two things. For all of those other combinations, there's always going to be something in there uh, for both sets of, uh, of possible products that don't allow it to be a precipitate. So that's why A through D is incorrect and E is the correct answer. So we can just kind of go like this. Iron and hydroxide will form a precipitate. Well, let's see. 32. Uh, we didn't really talk about strong acids and strong bases as far as being able to identify uh, one or the other. And I don't think it was on the list of objectives to, uh, to know the strong acids and the strong bases. Uh, so don't worry about that one. Uh, let's see, 33. 
You guys okay with that? That's the stuff we just covered today. And 34. We did 34, yes? Okay. Uh, so for 34, it's going to be an acid base neutralization there. Okay, so uh, we've got a monoprotic acid, KHP. It's a very common acid to use to titrate with. Uh, so we dissolve it in water. So what we need to know is how many moles of KHP do we have? So we've got 6.74 grams. It has a molar mass of 204.2 grams. So how many moles did that give us? So that gave us 3.3 .3 times 10 to the minus 2. moles of KHP. It's just called KHP because it's potassium hydrogen phthalate, so it's not phosphorus in there. Um, it, uh, so we've got that many moles of KHP. Uh, it's monoprotic. Hydroxides are monobasic, and so the sodium hydroxide is, so we know I have a one-to-one -one ratio between KHP and NaOH. So I'm going to say one mole NaOH, I'm running out of space here, one mole KHP, keep forgetting the H there, so I'm going to get 3.30 times 10 to the minus 2 moles sodium hydroxide, I hope you can read that. So I've got 3.30 times 10 to the minus 2 moles, NaOH, and that, uh, let's see, I titrated, I need to know how much of that was used in, from a 0 0.703 moles per liter, so I've got one liter for every 0 0.703 moles, so my moles cancel, and I get... Oh, I get the wrong answer because I did the wrong math. You get 4.69 times 10 to the minus 2 liters. And so that's going to be equal to... Ugh, that's not what I wanted. What the heck did I do? Hydroxide. Good call. Thank you. I was looking at the problem above. So that's a two moles of, of no, 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 one mole calcium hydroxide for every two moles of KHP. Yeah, it explains a lot. Okay, thank you very much for spotting that. See, we screw up two. I guess I don't get a perfect score in the exam, do I? Dang it. <laughs> okay, so that gives us 0 0.165 moles of calcium hydroxide. Now I can divide, divide that by 0 0.703, and I get a much better answer. There we go. I get 2.35 times 10 to the minus 2 liters, which is equal to 23.5 milliliters. There we go. Ooh. Yes. So the question is, how do I know I need those two moles of KHP for every one mole of 
calcium hydroxide. So I've got two OHs on the calcium hydroxide, and A B multiplied by one H, but I need to match both H's and OHs together. So I've got to have two A and B to match these two OHs from the one calcium hydroxide. That I can't hear you. You have to come up and ask. All right, folks. Uh, that's all we got. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Good luck tomorrow. Knock it dead. <laughs>